Hey up! Right, I'm just going to use some outtake footage for today's video because, um, well, it's a shame to waste it and I can't really film anything for this video. And I make absolutely no apologies for reusing this music because I like it. I have to listen to it all day while I'm editing the video together and it makes me happy. Right, it seems to me that most of the world is living in very difficult times at the moment. The cost of gas and electricity uh, by the end of this year at least will have just about doubled. The cost of our groceries over the last 18 months or so have increased by about one third. It looks very much as though interest rates are going to increase significantly in the coming months, which for anyone that owns a home or has any type of variable rate loan is going to be hit very hard financially. And on top of that, of course, which is a factor that is driving a lot of price increases, is that the cost of fuel has just about doubled in the last 18 months. And just like those other things that I've mentioned, I don't think it's peaked yet. I think these things are going to continue to go up. And as a result, poverty in a lot of countries is going to sort of increase to unprecedented levels, which is a real shame when you consider a lot of this has been driven by government policies and in many ways were avoidable. But I'm not going to dwell on that. The subject of today's video is how to save fuel on your motorcycle or if you're a car driver, in your car. Because there are a lot of things that you can do to cut down the amount of fuel that you're using on the journey that might help get you through what we're experiencing now and what is to come. Now, some of the information that I'm going to give you is anecdotal and it will be up to you to research it yourself to see whether it might work for you. The rest is based on hard facts which have been available to us for over half a century that people are either not aware of or they've just decided not to adhere to these practices because they can afford not to. You may well already know what I'm going to tell you and you've been putting it in practice for years like I have. And the reason for me making this video is not to teach my grandmother to suck eggs, so to speak. It's to help those that are struggling and might benefit from this information and maybe serve as a reminder to some of the more seasoned motorists that might appreciate a bit of a refresher. Now, before we get into the nitty gritty of this, I'd like to make it very, very clear. Safety always overrides economy. If you decide to sort of put into action some of the things I'm going to talk about in this video, Please use common sense. Don't take the pursuit of fuel economy to the extreme and to the point where it compromises your safety. I, I don't want that to happen as a result of this video. Last year here in the UK we saw the implementation of E10 fuels at the petrol pump which saw the end of sales of 95 octane E5 fuel in Britain and it was replaced by what is technically 95 octane E10 fuel. Now, despite having a 95 octane rating, E10 fuel is not as economical as the old E5 95 octane. So last year, everybody that started using E10 saw a drop in their MPG figures. Now, our government told us that this drop would be about 1% and we wouldn't actually notice it. However, by January, the newspapers were full of complaints from motorists saying that they'd seen a drop of 10%, in some cases even more than 10% in their fuel economy. And I myself in my car, when I first filled up with E10 fuel, not only did I notice that the car ran like a bag of spanners at times, especially on startup when it was cold, but I instantly lost about 5 miles per gallon with E10 fuel as opposed to the old 
E5. I own a 2019 Mini Clubman. Now, the manufacturer's stated government MPG figures for that car are 47 MPG using the old E5 fuels. As we all know, these stated figures are rarely achievable by the user because the, those figures are achieved under controlled environments which we as drivers don't have access to. And it's actually the same system that they're now using for assessing the range of electric vehicles, which is why people are finding they can't get anywhere near the stated figures with their electric cars. To a large extent, these figures supplied by the manufacturer don't take into account things like hills, headwinds, and ambient temperatures, all of which affect fuel economy. Nevertheless, by and large, on the old E5 fuels, I could achieve 45 miles to the gallon quite reliably, which I thought was acceptable. I didn't think that was too shabby. Now, when I switched to E10, this dropped to, well, just under 40 miles to the gallon. 39.7, 39.8 miles to the gallon. I never managed to get it up to the 40 mpg mark using the onboard fuel computer, which you know most modern cars are equipped with these days. And those sit figures were certainly borne out by the frequency with which I was having to refill the vehicle, because I'm one of those people that I like to run my tank almost dry before refilling. So, you know, it was obvious that I was losing a good chunk of mileage per tank compared to the old E5. Now, E5 is still available, but it's available in the form of E5 Super Unleaded. In a lot of garages, this will be 99 octane. In my local garage, it's 97 octane, so that's two more than the old original E5. Or should I say standard E5. Now the national average pricing for this particular product, whether it be 97 octane or 99 octane, is 10 to 12 pence per litre more than standard E10. I'm lucky in my local garages it's just 9 pence dearer. So just before Christmas this year I switched back from E10 to E5 Super, which as I say from my local garage is 97 octane. And not only did the car return to its normal excellent running order, but I noticed a significant increase in miles per gallon. Now, I've got to admit, I barely believe these figures myself, but I'm telling you the truth, this is what I personally have experienced with my 2019 Mini Clubman. It goes against all common sense and everything that we've been told. My miles per gallon figures increased to between 51 and 52 miles to the gallon. And on my recent trip to Brighton, it even hit 54 miles to the gallon for a while. Didn't stay there though. Now, my partner was still using E10 and she has a very similar car to me. It's a Mini, a different Mini, but it has the same engine. So, as an experiment, we tried the same with her car. Now, we couldn't achieve this when she was driving, but when I drove the car for a while, again, I could get it up to 52 miles per gallon using this 97 octane fuel, E5 fuel, from my local garage. So it wasn't just an aberration of my car, although it may be an indication of, you know, the model of engine. These are not performance vehicles, they're just general family cars with average performance and average power output. Now, I can't guarantee that this is going to be the same for every vehicle. This is just my observations with my vehicle, and I should add that these figures were achieved using the sort of tricks and skills that I've picked up over the years for saving fuel, which will be coming up in the second half of this video. Now, those government figures that were released of a 1% increase in, you know, fuel consumption, it was obvious when they announced that that it was a load of rubbish because other countries that had done similar things had officially announced significantly higher figures. So it was clear that Boris and his bunch had heavily weighted the information to get us to accept it. If I remember rightly from a video that I released last year, India's official figures were 5%. Now, again, like general MPG figures, these figures do not take into account things like going up hills, encountering high headwinds, 
carrying multiple passengers you know there are so many variables that these tests simply cannot cater for and then you've got to take into account how these fuels affect driver behavior because you know if you find your car isn't accelerating how you need it to you'll put your foot down harder in order to get the desired safe acceleration required for integrating with other traffic at things like junctions roundabouts and slip roads which will use significantly more fuel which for a lot of drivers will account for that perceived 10% or more loss in fuel economy it's not just the loss of power from fuel it's the way that loss of power changes the way that people have to drive something which no one seems to have taken into account while i was researching this video i came across a newspaper article i think it was something like the liverpool echo or something like that with a statement or advice from the rsa on how to save fuel during the current sort of fuel crisis now they did give one or two sort of useful snippets but they didn't really go far enough but what did appall me was that they were encouraging people to use supermarket fuel and to stick to e10 now organizations like the rac and the aa here in the uk are becoming more and more irrelevant every day there was a time when i did trust the information advice that they handed out but their bread and butter income from broken down vehicles is becoming less and less with every passing month vehicles are a lot more reliable than they used to be and these days both of our organizations have become bankers by providing car loans well all manner of loans etc and insurance brokers as well as other sort of financial related services so i take everything they say with a pinch of salt and the advice that the rac gave in this particular article really annoyed me to be honest now bearing in mind what i've discovered with my car they said that you should stick to e10 fuel and there's no point using E5 Super Unleaded unless you own a performance car that is designed to use it. Well, that's a load of rubbish. They even went so far as to say that using these branded fuels over supermarket fuels was a false economy because they're both the same fuel. There's no difference between them, which I thought was quite appalling. Now, yes, it's common knowledge that whether it's an Esso tanker, an Asda tanker, a shell tanker a bp tanker or a tesco or morrison's tanker they all fill up with exactly the same base stock fuel from the same distribution depots so the base stock is the same it's what happens to that fuel before it reaches the petrol tank of your car that's important or your motorcycle obviously i'm starting to talk like a politician and just talking about cars instead of motorcycles supermarkets are selling this fuel cheap and they still need to make a profit so the additives that they will put in that fuel to make it more suitable for cars ranges from zero to minimal additive packages and that includes chemicals to stabilize the fuel or detergent packages designed to stop your fuel system from fouling up and your car becoming uneconomical to run and these packages make a difference now i'm not in any way supporting the big brand oil companies but obviously they need to create a differential to justify the extra 10 pence or so that they charge for their e5 super fuels so they go a lot further with these packages a cleaner engine with a cleaner fuel system will run better and more economically so they use the very best detergents and they often use them in much higher proportions that alone can make a significant difference in the mpg that your vehicle achieves but on top of that they do use chemicals that raise the octane level they also use chemicals that allow the petrol to form a finer mist when it's pushed through the injectors to power your engine which improves economy and power by providing a much cleaner more complete burn thus using less fuel there are advantages to these fuels as i've discovered now i know there are additives that you can buy that will do these things that you add to the petrol yourself but 
I've usually found over the years that you will spend more money doing it that way than just buying a good quality petrol from a reputable brand. But it's up to you, try whatever you like. Now, I'm not suggesting for a minute that this will work for everyone. Different cars, different motorcycles have different engines which have different characteristics which all may react differently to these sorts of fuels. And certainly, if you're a speed merchant, you're unlikely to see any real gains. But I crunched the numbers based on current average fuel prices between E10 and my experiences with E10 and the current E5 Super that I'm using and worked out that the cost per mile would be 21 pence per mile for E10 and just under 18 pence per mile for the E5 Super 97 Octane. I'm struggling to believe those numbers myself. I think part of it is because fuel is now so expensive that the financial difference between the two grids is minimal because in just over a year, the price differential has moved from 10% more expensive for the super fuels to about 5%. And that percentage is going to get smaller as the price of fuel goes up. As I've said, this might not work for everyone, but if you can afford to just experiment, give it a try and let me know what your findings are. Right, let's look at other ways of cutting down your fuel usage, the things that I put into practice to minimise the amount of fuel that I use. Now... First up, if you're in the market for a new motorcycle, now is the time to look at downsizing. Smaller, economical motorcycles are going to future-proof you against this situation getting worse. A 350 to, I don't know, 500cc motorcycle makes far more sense in this current economic climate than a big 1000cc or 1200 bike or larger. Speed limits are currently being dropped or lowered all over the UK at the moment. Big bikes make no sense at all anymore. A motorcycle with a base level performance of around about 100 miles per gallon makes far more sense than something that only does 60 or 70 miles to the gallon. That is a huge difference and you're only going to be able to travel at similar speeds. And the other thing is engine modes. Now I know some motorcycles have them, my T120 and my Bubba Black have them. Although they're very simplified, you've basically got rain mode or road mode. My partner's Mini has a similar system fitted. It's got eco, normal and performance modes. Using the E5 Super, we found in the Eco mode, it was giving the worst fuel mileage. It seems to be little more than a gimmick. And I actually got the best results from that car in performance mode. So have a play around with those modes if they're fitted to your vehicle. Some give better fuel economy than others, and it's not always the one that you expect. Now, the other tip for car drivers, if you have air conditioning fitted to your vehicle, set it to auto. As you know, your air conditioning does use some of the fuel from your fuel tank, and it can significantly increase your fuel consumption. Auto uses a mixture of recycling air from the cabin and cooling air from the outside. Now the cabin air is already cooled so it's not having to work quite so hard and it could knock a few tenths of a mile off your fuel consumption. Now if you have an older car that simply has um, a recirculation facility, i.e. it's just constantly recirculating air from the cabin, be careful. There was a bit of controversy about this back in the 1990s where your cabin is basically a hermetically sealed container and you if you keep recycling air it can build up levels of carbon dioxide in the cabin which might make you drowsy or slow your reactions down i'm not sure if there is any real danger from this but i know back in the 1990s it was quite the topic of conversation for quite some time in all the motoring magazines etc so just be aware of that if you don't have air conditioning try to resist the edge to open all your windows fully especially sunroofs 
because it basically turns your car into an open parachute, which will obviously adversely affect your fuel economy. If you have to open your windows because you're getting too warm, only open them slightly and keep your speeds low. Sub 40 miles an hour with your windows partially open apparently causes the least amount of drag. Similarly, for motorcyclists, stuff like permanently installed panniers, if you're not using them, don't drag them about everywhere you go on your bike. Again, you're effectively carrying around what is tantamount to a parachute permanently attached to your bike. If you don't need those panniers on for your journey, take them off and leave them in the garage. A small backpack is probably all that's needed on most journeys to carry the essentials that you actually need to have with you. Next up, servicing. Make sure that your bike or your car is regularly serviced so that it's in optimum running condition. Tired engine oil can have an effect on fuel economy and I would suggest if you have the ability to do so, change to a full synthetic if your vehicle will run with it. I had a complete video on this subject last year. Most vehicles can run quite safely on full synthetic oils, which can significantly reduce your fuel consumption. Also, pay particular attention to your brakes. Brakes that are banding obviously are going to create excess fuel usage. So can underinflated tyres. An underinflated tyre is more flexible. It effectively deforms where it touches the road. Now, tyres are designed to do this anyway, but if your tyres are underinflated, they will deform more, which will cause more rolling resistance, which will lead to excess fuel usage. Check your tyres regularly, at least weekly, and make sure that they're topped up to the maximum permitted amount that the manufacturer recommends. Also, pay particular attention to your tyre pressures as we move from summer through into winter. Cold air is less dense than warm air, so those changes in temperature could significantly reduce your air pressures. So checking and adjusting your tyres weekly will ensure that your bike is always running at optimal efficiency with those tyres. And last but not least, your chain. As we all know, from the engine to your rear wheel, a significant amount of power is lost because of friction through your gearbox, chain and sprocket. Ensuring that your chain and sprockets are clean and are properly lubricated will go a long way to minimising that friction. So keep on top of your chain, check it regularly, don't allow it to dry out, don't allow it to get too dirty. Again, I've made videos on how to do this. Keeping your chain in good condition and well lubricated will pay you back at the fuel pumps. The difference is that all these things will make a small, but cumulatively together, they should make a tangible difference. Now, if you just alter the way you drive on top of that, you can improve this even further. Now, first of all, keep your speed in check. I've often heard it said that the most economic speeds to travel at are between 50 and 60 miles per hour. I think 56 miles per hour was often mooted as being the ideal speed. And this is probably why in more recent months we're witnessing more and more cars sitting in the inside lane on motorways travelling at 60 miles per hour. That lane used to be the preserve of goods vehicles. That's all changing. But more importantly, it's how you get up to that speed. Now, acceleration. Sometimes you've just got to do what you've got to do. Our roads are busy. There's times when you need to integrate with traffic uh, roundabouts, junctions and slip roads, and you have no choice but to accelerate reasonably hard. But if you can avoid doing that in other situations where it's safe to do so, take your time, slow, smooth acceleration without putting too much stress on the engine will save you a shed loads of fuel. Hard acceleration really achieves nothing. All you're doing is pouring copious amounts of fuel through your injection system into your engine and getting very little back for it. You're just wasting it. Three or four seconds of hard acceleration can provoke a significant 
and useless loss of fuel. Graceful and gradual unhurried acceleration will again pay you back at the fuel pumps. Don't worry about people behind you and holding them up. Be a man, stand your ground and do what is best for you. And before I get any comments about tailgaters, I read only yesterday that the EU is introducing new legislation to have anti-tailgating equipment fitted to all vehicles. So that will eventually become a thing of the past. Now, when you're cruising, I have found that cruise control, if you have it fitted, sometimes can come in handy for saving fuel. The slightest movement of your wrist on a bike or your foot in a car can send you creeping over the speed limit or dropping back so you have to sort of accelerate to get back up to your intended speed again. A cruise control keeps your vehicle at a steady speed, which will help towards saving fuel. So if the conditions are appropriate for using your cruise control, use it. Right, so I've discussed how to make your vehicle run as economically as possible. We've discussed fuel grades and we've discussed how to get up to cruising speed in the most economical manner possible. What about stopping and slowing down? Using your brakes incorrectly or excessively can cause excessive use of fuel. I've discussed this in videos before. You've expended a lot of fuel getting up to the speed that you're at. Look well ahead. And if off in the distance you see that there's a change in the speed limit, you know, it's dropping from 50 to 30 or whatever, or you see the chevron sounds that indicate that way off in the distance there is a sharp bend, or it's as simple as something in the distance like a tractor that you know is going to slow you down significantly. Don't wait until you get on top of that hazard or speed limit change before you take any action. As soon as you spot that hazard or speed limit change in the distance, back off your throttle. A lot of people will just continue using fuel by cruising until they get close to these obstacles and then they'll waste all that fuel by just turning into brake dust and heat by applying the brakes. Most motor vehicles these days have minimal engine braking. So shutting your throttle off early will use minimal fuel. It'll allow your vehicle to slow down safely and naturally in a timely manner ready to sort of deal with that obstacle or speed limit change. Basically what I'm saying is use your brakes as little as possible, but I'm saying that and sort of rolling my eyes at the same time because what I don't want people doing is prioritizing economy over braking safety. If you've got to use your brakes, use them. I see a lot of people sort of driving in a manner that I call point and square driving. You know, they're either pressing their accelerator or they're pressing the brakes. There's no in between. And that kind of driving uses the maximum amount of fuel possible. Shutting your throttle off early and allowing your vehicle to coast in order to adjust for obstacles and speed limits is the most economical way of riding. Now, I could go on and on and on, you know, various little tips. What I'll do is I'll sort of stop here. There's just one more point that I want to make before I go. And please, if you personally have any other tips that you think might be useful to other people, share them in the comments section down below. Now, the last little thing that I want to discuss is what I think is known as drafting. It's a practice that was first used in motor racing of days gone by. And this is the act of using the slipstream of another vehicle, often a high-sided van or goods vehicle, to lessen wind resistance against you as a motorcyclist. And in doing so, substantially cut down the amount of fuel that you're using to travel along. Now this can be done quite safely and if it's done properly you can save huge amounts of fuel. Now I'm going to stress the word safely do not exceed the two second rule. In fact if you're doing it properly it's more like the four second rule. You'll be at least four or five seconds behind this vehicle depending on the size of the vehicle and the speed that you're traveling at. 
when a large vehicle is moving along at speed, it creates a sort of bow wave of air, which creates a slipstream of calm, clean air behind it, which is travelling at the same speed as that vehicle. So when you slip into it, you suddenly find all the wind resistance that you're normally hitting travelling at speed just disappears. So your engine isn't having to work so hard, it's not pushing against the wind, against the air in order to maintain that speed. You'll use less fuel. But you can take this a step further on a motorcycle. Once you get into that slipstream, gradually drop back further behind that vehicle until you reach the point where you experience buffeting hitting your back from behind. This is the vortex where that slipstream from that vehicle starts to collapse. And you can use this like a surfer uses a wave to propel him forward. If you can get just slightly ahead of that vortex, it will effectively push you and your motorcycle along, further reducing your fuel consumption. That goods vehicle is effectively pushing you along on a curtain of air. Now, this does require a little bit of concentration, and it's really only going to work for you on dual carriageways and motorways, but it will allow you to travel a lot further on a lot less fuel just please do it safely and i will say this right now tailgating a vehicle is not more effective it's less effective so stay well back from that vehicle once again thank you so much for watching this and my other videos and in doing so helping to support this channel i really do appreciate it i hope that this video has given you some insight as to how you can save money and fuel yet still be able to continue traveling you know as much as possible if you have found this video useful please leave a like and if you're not a subscriber consider subscribing to the channel it really does help me out i will of course be back next week so until then please ride safely and i'll see you soon